I'm so honored that the work I did with Jonah Berger is receiving this award today, and we're both incredibly sorry that we can't be there to receive the award and, and be a part of the discussion of the impact this paper has had on the field. In lieu of being there in person, we're sending this video, and we were asked to record not only a thank you, which is obviously a key part of this, we're so grateful, but also a brief description of the work we did and the findings. And so after this brief introduction that I'm providing, what you'll see is a clip of me presenting some of our key findings at the National Academy of Sciences several years ago. I hope you enjoy it. So I want to begin actually by going back in time to my days as a graduate student when I split my hours between sleep, data analysis, and reading the New York Times online. <laughs> I became curious when the New York Times began posting a list of the most widely emailed articles on its website. And I wondered why do some articles make it onto this list while others fail? As a social scientist and lover of big data, it wasn't long before I came up with a solution to solve my curiosity curious problem. And that was, I hired someone to build a web crawler and visit the New York Times website every 15 minutes and scrape all of the news articles that appeared on the website, as well as their precise locations on the site and whether or not they were on the most emailed list. This data, which I collected for about three months and amounted to about 7,000 articles in 2008, allowed me to analyze what kinds of content drive what makes the most emailed list after carefully controlling for exactly what was featured where and for how long. So the question my co-author and I needed to answer in order to analyze this data was what theories did we have about what might drive the New York Times most emailed list so that we could test those theories. The first is a very natural prediction that comes from extensive social science research showing we care deeply about the impressions we make on others. So we all want to be known as the person who shares interesting and unexpected news. And, and therefore, we very intuitively expect more interesting and more surprising content to be shared. Along similar lines, if we share a new review of a fantastic restaurant or some suggestions on how to cure the common cold, that suggests that we're in the know and valuable connections to have. So that will be self-enhancing, and we expect useful content to be shared. A little less intuitively, though, we also expect more positive news to be shared for self-enhancement reasons. We all want to be associated in others' minds with the positive, and so we would want to share those kinds of positive stories to create those kinds of impressions and connections. Another motive, though, that we think might drive a lot of sharing is social bonding. So a lot of people have even argued that communication evolved as a form of social bonding, as a way to help us connect with others, keep tabs on people in our social networks. And therefore, we think sharing might be motivated in part by social bonding. One reason that we might share things and, and form stronger connections through social bonds is over emotional experiences. It turns out that having shared emotional experiences brings us closer to other people. And so if we share emotional articles, we may be able to use sharing to enhance bonds. We also thought that sharing could form, be a form of emotion regulation. When we experience strong emotions in response to an article, for instance, the activating effect or the anxiety-producing effect of reading a story about terrorism, or the awe-inspiring impact of reading a story about the search for life on other planets, that is difficult to regulate. And in order to make sense of those extreme emotions, it's actually helpful to discuss them with others. So we expect highly activating emotions to be widely shared. <laughs> while on the flip side, deactivating emotions like sadness cause us to withdraw into ourselves. So we predicted that deactivating emotions would reduce sharing. So let me now dive into an actual analysis of the data. And what I can show you first is that advertising matters, as you might expect. So for instance, a one standard deviation increase in the time a story spends as the lead article on the New York Times homepage increases its likelihood of making the most emailed list by about 20%. But what's amazing is that content matters almost as much as advertising, and in some cases, more so. So first, we see that some of these intuitive things matter quite a lot. After controlling for how long an article spent on the homepage and where, we see that more interesting, surprising, and useful articles are more likely to make the list. But more exciting still, if I can get this to work, More positive and more emotional stories are also significantly more likely to make the list. 
And we also see that stories containing more activating emotions are more likely to make the most emailed list. So stories involving anxiety, anger, and awe are more likely to make the list, while deactivating emotions like sadness reduce an article's chances. I hope you enjoyed that brief summary of our work. I was asked also to talk a little bit about the impact it's had, and we've been blown away by the response to this paper. It's generated over a thousand citations on Google Scholar. It's in the 0.06th percentile of most downloaded papers on SSRN, has generated hundreds of media mentions. And in my personal opinion, the coolest thing, it generated its own viral video with more than 5 million views. Here's a little clip of that video for your viewing enjoyment. Hello, Internet. Thoughts compete for space in your brain. Cat photos, news stories, belief structures, funny gifts, educational videos, not so educational videos, and your thinking inventory is limited. A thought without a brain to think it dies. Now, we can treat thoughts as though they're alive, specifically alive like germs. That might sound weird, but stick with me. Take jokes. Jokes are thought germs that live in your brain, and when you tell the joke to another brain, you help it to reproduce, just like when you have the flu and sneeze to help it reproduce. This germ gets gets into its host by snot through the mouth and this one by words through the ear, but it's reproduction either way. Logging onto your social media then is exposing yourself to everyone's mental sneezes. Each post a glob of snot with a thought germ trying to get into your brain. If not for permanent residence, then at least long enough to get you to press the share button and sneeze it with everyone you know. In this analogy then, a funny cat photo with the perfect caption is a superflu. Now, just as germs exploit weak points in your immune system, so do thought germs exploit weak points in your brain, aka emotions. Once inside, thought germs that press emotional buttons get their hosts to spread them more, measurably more. Well, except sadness. Sad thoughts don't get very far. Awe is pretty good, which is why websites that construct thought germs like biological weapons arm them with titles like Seven Whatevers That Will Blow Your Mind or The Shocking Secret Behind This Thing. But anger is the ultimate edge for a thought germ. Anger bypasses your mental immune system and compels you to share it like nothing else. Being aware of your brain brain's weak spots is necessary for good mental health, like knowing how to wash your hands. Because even without intentional construction, any thought germ on the internet can, on its own, grow more infectious as it spreads. Thank you all so much again for this tremendous honor. I can't tell you how much it means to both me and Jonah to receive this award, and we're tremendously sorry that we can't be with you today to accept it.